I'm going to bring a message this morning uh, because I firmly believe, uh, and I've, I've had to learn, I, I am uh, soon approaching over 30 years in ministry, um, and I've been dealing with ministry a long, long time. I come uh, in my early years from a legalistic, fundamental uh, background. Uh, many of you were kind of the same. It was popular then, and uh, you get kind of caught up in legalism, and what happens in legalism, you start judging other people and that your life is measured against someone else's life, and you're, and you're living by a bunch of rules. And as long as you keep the rules, you're okay, and if you keep some of the rules, you're better than somebody else and the whole nine yards. Uh, but I, I, I tell you, I, I hope I, and I really believe that I'm at the place where God wants me because I am 100%, uh, no doubt about it, a grace man. I am about grace. I am about forgiveness. I am about mercy. I am about taking my sin from me because I can't get rid of it. I'm about God doing that for me. And I want everybody, I want to shout that from the rooftops that I am a grace man and God's grace is absolutely wonderful. And... Uh, Legalism, it doesn't mean that when we violate the principles of God that they, they go unnoticed. It doesn't mean that, they, that they're not, uh, uh, God doesn't chastise us. But he is a loving father. And we've got this preconceived idea in our mind that God is going to strike us down every time we step out of line. And that's just not the case because he is a good God. He's a loving God. He is a forbearing God. He is a long-suffering God. He is a patient God. He is just absolutely giving us every ounce of grace that we can tolerate. We don't get what we deserve. We get his love. We get his forgiveness. If we all got what we deserved, we'd all bust hell wide open, wouldn't we? So I want to share with you this morning a message, and I just, I've entitled it, Let's Look at Grace, because I think that's the thing. Most of us don't get it. And there's a little clip I want you to understand, because here's the thing about grace. Before you can learn about grace, you've got to let go of some stuff. You've got to let it go, and you've got to quit carrying it around. And all of us have carried it before. We have. All of us have carried stuff before. And many of us carry garbage and trash we do i want you to watch the clip then i'll be back and we'll look at john chapter number eight you can kind of find it look it up on your phone your pad whatever you're doing and if you don't know the story it's the woman that's been accused of being caught in the act of adultery and i'll be back in just a minute and we'll talk about grace hey cat Jesus. Oh, it's been a long time. Yeah, um, I didn't expect to see you here. Whoa, what's that smell? The smell? Oh, um, well, that's my trash. I just, I'm a little embarrassed about it. Oh, well, is that why you've been avoiding me? Avoiding you? I, I, I haven't really been avoiding you. I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to get close to you. I mean, I, I just, I don't want you to smell it. I'll take it, Kat. Come oh, on. Oh, no, 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 no. That's okay. I mean, I made it. It's my trash. You know, I should carry it. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, but Kat, I mean, this is my job. Right. I take people's trash. That's what I do, so. Right, okay. Well, maybe I could go and just clean it up a little bit, you know, and then I'll just, I'll come back. No, Kat, I don't need you to do that. Um. Okay, I'll take it from you so you don't have to carry the weight. Oh, well, I. Come on. Uh, oh. Just, just hand it over. Uh, All, right. All right, let go. Let go. Yes, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, How's that feel? Weird. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah, just loosen it up a Whoa, little bit. Check that out. I don't know if I've ever moved like that before. Well, I mean, that is crazy. I just, I feel so free and alive. I, it's I mean, the lack of trash. Wow. It's just like, this is the craziest feeling I have ever had. I just, it's like something's missing, you know? Well, I, I just, um, Get used I, to feeling free, because that's yeah. what you are now. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, what okay. are you doing? I just, I got to get one thing, okay? Hold on just a minute here. Get one thing? No, 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 no. Don't open the bag. Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice. I really appreciate all that you've done for me. What's going on here, Kat? What? Look, I'll take the trash, but you need to put that back. Oh, um, no, actually, um, that's okay. This is mine. It's my piece. I want to keep it. No, it goes right back in the bag, so I'll help you. Here, no, 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 put no, it no. here. No, Jesus, I, I need to remind myself not to make more trash. I mean, that just Kathleen, makes sense. Kathleen, I will remind you not to make more trash, oh, okay? Oh, well, Jesus, you that's know... That's what I do. I mean, we'll walk together. I know, but I should be in a better place than this by now. I mean, I just, I'm constantly doing things wrong, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm constantly letting you down. No, the only thing that's letting me down is, is, is you taking 
bringing this stuff back. Okay. Look, I took care of the trash before you even created it. <gasps> Look, don't you see what's happening? Every time I take your trash away, you come back and, and take another piece. And the more pieces you carry around, the more trash you attract. It reeks. Cat. When I look at you, I don't see your sin. I see you, the real you, the free you. This is what I'm fighting for. This is what I died for. Jesus, I'm sorry. I just, please forgive me. I've already forgiven you. The question is, will you forgive yourself? As I was watching that, tears came to my eyes because we sometimes forget the magnitude of how much Jesus loves us and why he really died. He didn't die just to create a great story. He died to take our trash, to take our sin, to take our place. And let's talk a little bit about grace. Jesus likes spending time with sinners. Did you know that? We think that Jesus is for the righteous, but he's not really for the righteous. He's for the sinners. If you're really righteous, you'll realize you're a sinner. You've just been saved by grace. Amen? You've got to come to the place and the magnitude in your life that you realize that without Christ, you could not make it alone. You have to be bankrupt. Uh, bankrupt. And the, the Greek word for that is the word tokos. It doesn't mean panache, that you can hang on to a little bit, that you've got some substance. It means that you have to be bankrupt, and it's the word tokos. And when we're bankrupt in our spirit and we know that there's no other way that we can find God except through Jesus Christ, we can't find him by being good, we can't find him any other way, then, then and only then are we able to see grace the way that it is. And Jesus loved spending time with sinners. He was God and he was perfect and he spent a three and a half year ministry all the time with sinners. We never find him spending time with righteous or religious people. He, people became righteous and people became religious with the right kind of religion, but he spent his time with sinners. He talked with them, he ate with them, he cried with them, he served with them. People weren't just a charity project for him. He loved them, he cared about them, he listened to them, and he offered unconditional hope and compassion. Wealthy people don't need, or healthy people don't need a doctor, Jesus said, sick people do. And that's why he spent time with the needy, the helpless, and the depraved. He came down to their level because they could never rise to his. Let me let that sink in. Jesus came down to our level because we can never rise to his without what he's going to do for us. He wasn't out to prove how good he was or how bad they were. He just wanted to offer them hope. Jesus just isn't a friend of sinners. He's, he is only the friend of sinners. Well, let me let resonate and let that sink in. Jesus isn't just a friend of sinners. He is only the friend of sinners. The righteous who say they have no sin, the righteous who say that they're not sinners, then they'll really find out that they're not Jesus' friend because then they're trying to make it on their own. But when you realize you're a sinner and that you need hope and the only one that can give you hope is Jesus Christ, then you will say, that is truly my friend. That is truly my hope. Jesus is the friend of people who are willing to admit that they have problems. If we understand that we have issues, if we recognize that we have stuff we cannot conquer, then Jesus is nearer to us than we ever thought. And you don't have to be good to be Jesus' friend. Let me say that one more time. You don't have to be good to be Jesus' friend. You just have to be honest. And for many of us, our default view of God is that he's angry, he's vengeful, he's a deity who's just looking for an excuse to punish us, but we would do better to picture God like Jesus because that is exactly who God is, is Jesus. Jesus said he came to show us the Father. In other words, he modeled God for us. His words, his actions, his perspective, his, priority, his priorities, and uh, they were identical with God's. And if Jesus loves bad people, it means God loves bad people. If Jesus is the friend of sinners, it means God is a friend of sinners. So this morning, I want you to open up your heart, and I want you to open up your mind, and I want you to put on, a sh on, on the shelf, 
any religious comprehension that you had that God is out to get you because that is not the case. Not in a bad way, but in reality, God is out to get you in a good way. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God is looking for true worshipers, seeking true worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. And that means you've got to be honest with God. That means you've got to fess up, and that means you've got to say, God, I can't make it on my own, that my hope is in Christ. One of the songs they sang, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. And that's where we have to be. So we want to look at grace this morning, and I hope it'll open a whole new venue. And I, and I think I want to start this way, because I think we're all like cat in the clip. We like to gather our trash. You call it sin, you call it one. Trash is kind of a, a nice way of saying it. We put it all in a bag. We do. And I just want to, you know, get down and dirty because we're dealing with trash. And get real honest and open and say, this morning, I, I think we need to start, not in, but we need to start this way. We need to start asking the question to everyone in this audience, myself included, because I'm going to be the first to raise my hand. I'll be the first to say, that's me, uh, because, listen to me, just because a person is a spiritual religious leader does not mean they're without sin. Doesn't matter who you are in here this morning, you are not exempt from violating God's principles. And we are all sinners, the Bible tells us that. But I want to start this way. And, and it's going to take honesty, it's going to take openness, it's going to take some of you to the place that, that because I want to acknowledge it right now so that you can resonate on what I'm going to say, so you can focus on what I'm going to say. I, I'm going to speak to the whole group, and I'm, I'm asking this and I'm saying this with no judgment whatsoever, with no condemnation whatsoever, because there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. The Scripture tells us, be careful how we judge, because the way we judge will be judged. And we like to use that verse as, a, as a, a, a springboard where we can look at other people's lives. You have no right to look at anyone else's lives except look at their fruit. And normally if they're producing fruit, it's maybe not sometimes what we would do, but it normally comes from intent to please God or to do something good. That's what fruit does. So here's the deal. Here's the mandate. I'm going to ask you to be honest. I'm going to ask you to be open. I'm going to ask you to uh, be bold. I'm, not, I, I, I'm going to ask you not to worry about what anybody thinks. I'm also going to ask you not to name, think, or even think about uh, uh, how bad it was, this thing I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask this. To every person in this place, I want to start this way. I know I'll probably get some criticism for it. But if you have ever done something in your life you wish you could, you could have undone, you wish you'd have never done it, you wish it had never happened. You wish that they'd never been part of it. Uh, you, you, you wish you'd never been there. Uh, you, you just absolutely wish that you could erase it from your memory, from your mind. It was the greatest mistake maybe you ever made, or that's what you think. Maybe it caused the greatest guilt. If you have ever experienced that this morning, just stand up. I'm standing. Here's why I wanted you to stand. For every one of you have, that, that feel this way, I want you to look around. You're not by yourself. You're not alone. And you're not perfect. And you can never, ever understand what grace is until you look around and you think, God, why did this happen to me? When you look around, that's what life is. It's allowing us to be honest and say, God, give me the hope that I need to get through this life and forgive me when I don't measure up. And let me just say this for every one of you that are standing, your sin did not shock God. You did not make God gas. You did not make God say, oh, I can't believe this. He knew exactly what you are, who you are, and whose you are. You are loved. You are in Christ. You are His. And the enemy wants you to, to think that you're not, but you are. And you need to shout it from the rooftops this morning that I am His. I am yours, Lord. And I am forgiven. And I have hope because of Jesus Christ, because Christ is grace this morning. And you need to let it go. You need to let it go 
And, and because as I resonate what I'm going to say this morning, some of you are going to think that this is just for me. But I want you to remember, everybody in this place, this message is for. With me included, my wife included, my family included, my church leaders included. We are all sinners, but we all need grace. And I want to know about grace. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Now, see, that takes the sting out of the guilt that we have because many times we think we're the only one who lets God down. There was an entire room, literally hundreds of people this morning, acknowledging at some point and place in their life there was something that they absolutely wish they could do over. Let me just say this. And God, it's already been wiped away if you've confessed it. You are remembering it, but God doesn't even remember it. When you stood up, just picture this in your mind's eye. God said, what are you standing up for? Because I cast it as far as the east is from the west, and I remembered it no more. Your slate was wiped clean. Jesus died for all of your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin. And if that be the case, I want to know all I can about this marvelous thing called grace. Grace. It's incredible. Take your Bibles. Turn to John chapter number 8. I don't know about you, but I felt a great release to see that many people standing. You know, it was my fear when I thought when the Holy Spirit said, have him do that. I kind of told Matt I was going to do it. My fear was that only two or three people would stand. Because if that had happened, I would have been in real trouble because that meant we would, have, we would have been in a crowd full of religious people, but maybe not people that experienced grace. The reason you could stand this morning is because you want hope in grace and because you've experienced grace and you want to know more about grace. In John chapter 8, we see something that's really important. It says in chapter 8, verse number 1, uh, in verse 53, it kind of frames it. It's kind of right above my Bible. Every, Jesus has been teaching. Everyone goes to his own house the night before. Uh, he, he revealed he was the living water. Israel's divided about Christ. The Sanhedrin is confused over Christ. Uh, he, he told them before Abraham was, uh, he said, I am. And, and, but in, it says, and they all go to their own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Don't you, don't you find that kind of uh, an alarming statement? He didn't even have anywhere to go. He didn't go to anybody's house. He went and slept on the ground at the Mount of Olives. Okay, and then the next day, look what it says. It says, everybody went to his own house, verse 53, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, this is the next morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. All the people. I could expand on that, but in other words, people came to the temple, and they didn't go to the scribes, Pharisees, and, and, and all the writers, and all of the, uh, the teachers of Israel. They came to Jesus. All the people that came to the temple came to Jesus, and he was teaching them. Now, imagine, I want you to get this idea. They're all coming to Jesus because he's offering hope. There's a great crowd in the temple. If you know anything about the temple, this would, this, it would dwarf this, the, the temple uh, that was built by Herod the Great. I mean, it would dwarf it. And people would be all through the temple. Literally, thousands of people would be coming to hear him. And he's teaching them. And I'm sure you could have heard a pin drop if Jesus had been teaching. And here, we would have been all ears, right? There would have been no nodding off in Jesus' class. Nobody be checking their texts and their messages and their emails if Jesus were here, right? Can I get an amen? amen? We wouldn't even do potty breaks if Jesus was here. We'd just cross our legs and hold it, amen? Because <laughs> we'd want to hear what he had to say. And he's there and he's teaching all the people and, and he sat in the temple and he sat down and taught them and that's the way that they did. They sat down, he'd take the scroll, he'd roll it out and he sat down and taught them. And then verse 3, what happens is something that's incredibly rude. He's teaching and then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. And that, that's a statement in and of itself that's, that's certainly subject to truth. Caught in the act of adultery. And they said to her, and they had set her in the midst. And they said to him, Teacher, now he's been interrupted, got this great crowd, the silence in the temple, and the scribes and Pharisees bring this woman, and we don't think she was caught in anything, we think it was a setup deal, and they bring her and they throw her at the feet of Jesus because we know they're trying to stump her, and that's what John's going to tell us, trying to stump Jesus. They bring this woman. And according to Leviticus 20:10, both had to be brought, both had to be sentenced. Male, where's the guy? All they're wanting to do is to stump Jesus, but watch Jesus stump them because you're going to see the real mind as we look at this because it's important. 
And, and then he, uh, they, they set her in the midst, and they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? You're here teaching. You're so magnificent. You can give us this insight to this thing. And they said, and this they said, testing him, that they might have something to which to accuse him by. He said, But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. He didn't acknowledge it. He just sets down, and there's so, so much speculation on what he wrote. It's not important what he wrote. Some say he wrote the Ten Commandments. Some uh, say he wrote grace. Some say he wrote this. We don't know what he wrote. It's pure uh, speculation. It does not matter what he wrote, but what matters was he's about to address them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, uh, said to them He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. They come and they had their stones. They got all the people there in the temple. They're trying to stump Jesus because, see, if he'd said stoner, it'd been, uh, uh, he would have violated the, the principle of, of uh, Hebrew law. And if he'd said stoner, let's kill her now, they'd have violated Roman law. They were looking for some reason to accuse him. And he said, you know what? It's not about that. He said, if you have never sinned, then you be the first one to throw the stone. And it says, and again... Look what it says. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, by the word, that's the Greek word gune. It's not a harsh word. It's, it's, it was a proper address using the word gune. Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. They brought me into the temple to accuse me. They brought for you to, to, to pose a sentence on me, to stone her. Uh, what does the law say? And he said, who has accused you here? Is there anyone here who's accused you? And she said, there's no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. They were expecting Jesus to have this, this ruckus about this woman or this idea that she was a, a sinful, uh, deceitful, dirty, trashy woman. And he said, I'm not even condemning you. Quite the contrary. For many of us, our default view of God is that he's angry, vengeful deity looking for an excuse to punish us. And as I said, we need to picture Jesus or God just like Jesus because that's exactly who he is. Jesus, when he came, he came to show us the Father. In John chapter number 14, verses 8 and 9, he said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, verses 8 and 9, as he talks to Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So listen to me this morning. If you think God is mad at you, then I want you to go back and understand that Jesus did not condemn the woman with the most vile uh, uh, violation of Hebrew law caught in the very act of adultery and he said I don't condemn you but go and sin no more neither do I condone what you've done but I don't condemn you go and sin no more his words his actions and his perspectives and priorities were identical to God's and if Jesus loves bad people it means God loves bad people for every one of you who stood up this morning never doubt this God never stopped loving you even at your worst moment even when you did that thing that you said, I wish I'd have never done, God never stopped loving you. I find it really odd that God never stops loving us, but people stop loving other people. We don't think about that. And we're to model after Jesus, Romans 8, 29. We're to be conformed in the image of Jesus. And as God forgives us, then what we should be more than anything else is a forgiving people. Spouses and husbands need to learn how to forgive. Families need to learn how to forgive. Children need to learn how to forgive. Church members need to learn how to forgive. Staff members need to learn how to forgive. And if you can't forgive, you'll never be what you need to be for God because, listen, Jesus could never be what God intended for him to be unless he exemplified forgiveness that came from the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. It's important that you remember that. 
and Jesus loved bad people, and if Jesus is the friend of sinners, it means God is the friend of sinners. We have to understand something about God. He is not intimidated by the sin the way that we are. We cringe at sin. We, we shrink at sin. We want to run and hide from sin. But listen to me. God is not intimidated by sin. God is bigger than our sin. That's why it does not intimidate him. He knows there's a medicine for the sin. He knows there's a cure for the sin problem. And that, that, that cure was Jesus Christ. When it says he died for our sins, he died for all of our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. I'm saying that, that's a pretty good cure, isn't it? You are not condemned because of your sin if you're in Christ. That debt was paid. It's paid. And you need to realize that. That's what grace does. We have to understand. And usually when someone tells us about something they did wrong, we're like, you did what? With who? Lord, have mercy. Well, yes, Lord will have mercy. He, he will, he has, he already will. But see, we're, we're taken back by that, but God is not taken back nor intimidated by our sin. Because see, even Paul said, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And then he gives a rhetorical question, because sin abounds more, what? Shall we sin more? And he said, God forbid. That's not the deal. The deal is when you do sin and you do get in that place and you do get in that trap and you do lose hope, you need to understand that God has already taken care of it. And if God has taken care of it, then you need to let it go and quit taking your trash back and quit carrying it around and quit carrying that guilt. Jesus shocks everyone in John chapter 8 when, G when they ask Jesus what to be done. They expected him to pronounce judgment on her. Jesus shocks them. He didn't throw any stones. He didn't gras uh, gasp in horror. He didn't blush, nor did he get upset. And you say, why? He didn't have to condemn this woman. You know why? Because he'd already stated in John chapter 3, you're going to see it on the screen, she was condemned already. If you're without Jesus Christ this morning, if you're not born again, if you're not saved, those Bible terms, and those are good Bible terms, and I'll never be ashamed of using them. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, you're condemned already. God and Jesus do not have to condemn you. You're already condemned. Look at what the Scripture said. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to judge you. He didn't come to strike you with lightning bolts. He didn't come to throw you in the pit. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be what? Somebody say it. Saved. saved. Everybody say it. Saved. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. And it says, He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son of God. And this is the condemnation. It did not come from God. This is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil or bad. Depends on what version you have. God didn't come to condemn you. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. You are condemned because of the humanity that you are. And the only way out of that condemnation is to know Jesus Christ. And that's why he told that woman, I don't condemn you. I'm not accusing you. How can you condemn somebody who's already condemned? But what did he tell her? Go and sin no more. He was gracious. He didn't judge her. And she absolutely knew that she needed a Savior. He looked past her sin and saw her. Thank God that Jesus looked past my sin and saw me. I'm glad Jesus didn't write me off because of my sin. I'm glad Jesus didn't throw me in the trash can and say, there'll never be any hope for you because of your sin. He looked past my sin and he saw me. And boy, if there is a sin issue in your life today, just let me say this. Jesus is not looking at the sin. He is looking at you. And he has hope for you. And he loves you. And if that sin is in your way this morning, just thank God that he has looked past your sin and he's looking at you. He saw her and his heart was moved with compassion and he speaks to her accusers, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. You know what he's really saying? Let me give you modern vernacular. Some of you stupid knuckleheads, that's what he's saying, who think you're so righteous, how dare you judge this woman because your sin is as bad as hers. You say, I might not have, my sin won adultery. It doesn't matter what sin. If you have broken one issue of the law, you have broken the entire law. Matt taught us that on Wednesday night. He used a verse out of John that actually talked about murder and adultery. And he said, it doesn't matter. Whichever one you've done, you've broken the whole law. And for many of you, if a man or a woman, if you looked at a man or a woman and you looked on them with lust, you know what Jesus said? You committed adultery. 
You know why? He said, you can't do it on your own. And I'm not looking at the sin because the sin does not shock me. I paid the price for sin. I became sin for you. I took that from you. You are free in me, and I'm looking past the sin, and I want to see the real you. It's not you that I'm looking at. Paul said, it's not I that sin, but the sin that dwells in me. When he was talking about the struggle in Romans chapter number 7. And notice this. He speaks to her accusers. He said, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. My wife said something interesting uh, several months ago. She said, some people love to be stone collectors. They just love to take a stone, put it in a bag. Take a stone, put it in a bag. They got somebody in mind, and they're just looking at that person or that individual or that family, and they're putting stones in the bag. They're just putting stones in the bag. They're not ready to throw them yet because they want a lot of stones. They don't want just one stone. They want a lot of stones. When they do harm, they want to do a lot of harm. Some people are stone collectors. And if you're a stone collector this morning, I'd say this. You have no right to be a stone collector because you've experienced grace and you've been forgiven. And your sin is no less than their sin. And I'd say just take your bag and dump your stones out and let the rocks fall right where they are. Amen? We'd be a whole lot better off if we didn't have stone collectors. People who wanted to impede harm on other people. And here's the people we want to impede harm on. Sinners. Isn't it odd? There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. And we tend to leave our wounded lying in a ditch when they really need our help. This morning, praise God for grace. And notice how age has a way of mellowing arrogance. The scripture says they went out from the oldest to the least. You know why? You know why that says that? Because us old folks, we understand what sin is. And we've committed a bunch of it. Amen. We've dealt with it a long time. And if we think about it, we have no right because, see, the older, the older you are, the more sin you're going to commit. You say, well, I don't know if I like you saying that. Well, I'm just being honest with you this morning. The older we are, the more sin we commit. But the older we are, the more we understand about grace. I don't hardly see old people walking around in bondage anymore. I don't see old people carrying guilt and burdens. You know why? They've understood they can let it go through their lifetime. And it says, from the oldest to the least, they dropped their rocks and went out. And the young ones were looking around saying, really? 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 Let me say something. You mature believers here today, you show forgiveness and grace and mercy, and these young people will learn from you. You wrap your arms around the worst person that you know and say, God loves you still, and that I love you still, and you're going to teach a generation something. Why do you think that thugs are taking over? Because they don't understand love and grace. They, they, they just take and take and take because nobody's wrapping the, uh, wrapped their arms around that crowd and said, look, God loves you and we love you. And life is precious. It's important. Listen to the words Jesus spoke to the woman. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she says, no, Lord. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. She's expecting judgment, but find something completely unexpected, compassionate, empathy, hope, and love. If justice must be served... We're all in trouble because we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 says that we're all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we have no right to be judging anyone. And I, I, I don't know the timing of the Holy Spirit, but I believe the timeness of this message is Holy Spirit given. I believe it's absolutely what the Holy Spirit wanted us to do. And see, when it comes to sin, the only one who has a right to condemn others is Jesus because he lived a sinless, perfect life. But you know what he did? He refused to condemn anyone. He refused. I'll not condemn you. I think if Jesus had one shot at fixing us, he would tell us how much he loves us. He wouldn't give us a lecture on our sin because he already knows that. And we already know that, don't we? If Jesus had one shot at fixing us on a one-on-one -on -one situation, he wouldn't be looking at someone and saying, well, this is really what you need to do. You know what he'd do? He'd take that moment, that opportunity, I believe with all my heart, and he'd look into our eyes and he would say how much he loved us. When Peter sinned, 
And the rooster crowed three times. You know what the scripture says? When Jesus came, he looked right in the eyes of Peter, and Peter looked right in the eyes of him. And he didn't get condemnation. He saw the, forgiven, the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ in his eyes. And you know what Peter did? He went out and wept bitterly. Jesus still didn't condemn him. He still loved him. You say, will Peter ever be fit? Jesus says, man, Peter, I want you to be the guy that will feed my sheep. He totally forgave him, totally restored him to ministry after Peter had backslid and gotten completely out of the ministry. And your life this morning may have spun out of control and you think God doesn't love you and you're not worthy anymore. And just let me say this, Jesus is not condemning you and ministry can still be a place for you today. Jesus loves you right now just as you are. He isn't standing yelling at us to climb out of our pits and clean ourselves up so that we can be worthy of him. He said, I'll come down and pull you out of the pit. That's what I came for. Don't get me wrong. Of course, sin is bad. Sin hurts, and it hurts others, and sooner or later, we will sin. Willpower, education, and good upbringing will not be enough. So if our hope is in sheer moral fortitude, we're toast, folks. We're going to get burned. You, you can try all you want, but you're still going to sin. Sorry. But isn't it great that grace will come on the scene and get us out of that sin issue? And we don't have to walk around embittered and embarrassed. Once we have confessed that thing, we need to move forward and move into the realm where Jesus wants us to be, and that's in love with him and know that he loves us. So here's how we do it. So here's the question. What should I do? We all stood up. We all realize that we're sinners. Are we all sinners? Amen? Amen. Now, some of us have been saved, born again, bought with a price. Matter of fact, I would say the majority of the people in here have been saved. But even, even those of us, we find it so hard to let go of this sin guilt. So you say, what do I do? What do I do? How do I get rid of it? Here's what you do. You embrace grace. You embrace grace. If there are no accusers then what, what do I do? God's offering forgiveness and God is offering grace. So what do I do? Do I shun grace away or do I receive it? Do I shun it away or do I receive it? If no one is accusing me and the only thing left is grace, because guess what? We all need to be accused, but Jesus said, I, I refuse to do it. I'm not condemning you. I'm loving you. And if he's loving us and he's not accusing us, you say, what do I do? What do I do? I say embrace grace. Embrace grace. In our family, we hug a lot. I've said this many, many times. You say, well, I think you said that not long ago. You're going to hear me say it a lot. I love to hug. Uh, matter of fact, Jackson, I think, stayed with us, and, and, and we just love to hug in front of the little ones. We even kiss. <laughs> but we kind of look at what they're watching. You know what? Kids want to see people hug and embrace. They want to see their parents hug and embrace. And they love getting a hug from you. They love getting a hug from you. So we'll do it and we'll watch and, and they'll grin. They'll grin. They'll just look up and say, Mama, you and Poppy are being silly. <laughs> but they're smiling. And as they get a little older, they'll say, Yuck. And when they get a little bit older, they'll say, get a room. <laughs> but they still love it. They still love it when you embrace. And we, we hug. Growing up, we were taught hugs, not drugs. Kind of corny, but I know. And, and I've noticed that some people are not good huggers. You just don't do it well. You're rigid. You're stiff. You don't know whether to shake hands or, 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 or uh, give the Roman class guys, come on, do I do a knuckle bust? Do I, do I do a slap thing and do some kind of sign thing? Or do I shake his hand? Do I hug his neck? Or what do I do? It's awkward for some people. Can I get an amen? Some people just do not know how to do it because they were never taught it. And I think that affects us when it comes to embracing grace from God. They don't know. You know, they're awkward. They get all tense and rigid, and they feel like they're hugging a mannequin, or you feel like you're hugging them. You know, you want to hug them, and they're like, hey, brother. Hey. And they give you the little pat. You know, you get a hug, you get the little pat on the shoulder. You know, that tells you they're awkward. They really are. You're thinking, poor thing, he don't know how to hug. Amen. Praise the Lord. They're they just awkward. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You know how awkward it can be, right? You get, you get a bunch of macho guys. Macho guys. 
Look, Matt is as macho a man as anybody in here. My son is a macho guy. Macho, 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 macho. I got to be a macho man. My son will still give me a kiss when I leave him or embrace him. And he's a macho man. Matt, same way. He'll hug me, and he'll hug me hard. I said, bro, you quit squeezing me like a bear. <laughs> Talk to him on the phone. He'll always say, love you. Love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> he makes it awkward. <laughs> love you. I'm thinking, love you too. <laughs> It's awkward for some people. And when God says, I'm not going to condemn you, I'm going to love you, it's hard for some people to allow God to love them. You don't hug well. You don't do some things well. You're so awkward. And that's how we react. When grace comes toward us, it's awkward. God offers us something that's too good to be true, unearned, unmerited, total forgiveness, and we don't know how to embrace it. We get stiff, we get uncomfortable waiting for the embrace to stop so that we can get back to the business of earning our way to heaven. And we just say, I need my trash back. And we go back and we start collecting trash again, and that's the battle. God wants to, us to embrace grace that he gives. We need to embrace grace or hug, if you will. We need to learn how to hug God back. If he's not condemning us and at our worst he's loving us, then we need to hug and love God back and embrace what God has done. You say, I cannot fathom it. I can't receive it. It's awkward. I'm so bad. That's why God loves you, because you're so bad. If you were so good, you wouldn't have any need for him. But he loves you because you're bad. He loves you because you need him. Every daddy loves their kids needing them. Every daddy loves giving to their, ki their kids. We just love it. Now, at some point in time, we say there's a limit sometimes on it. Because, see, that's our humanness. But God says there's no limit. There's no limit. It's incredible. So we need to embrace grace. Not only do we need to uh, understand there are no accusers. And see, grace is hard for most people to define. And let me define it a little bit, let alone embrace. The word is found throughout the Bible. Grace, grace, grace. Turn the page. Grace, grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Every time you turn around, David found grace. In fact, it's arguably the most important concept and term in the Bible. Grace is the foundation of Christianity and the essence of salvation. I want you to listen to this. It's the foundation of Christianity and the essence of salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. I want to say it this way. Not for by grace are you saved. Because really, now you're going to have to hang on to this with me. Grace didn't save you. For by Jesus Christ are you saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Grace didn't save you. Jesus Christ saved you. Now hang with me before some of you are gasping with the theological premise. But understand that Jesus Christ is grace. He's grace. That's why the scripture says, for by grace are you saved, because Jesus came in John chapter 1, verse 14, full of grace and truth. Now, I'll get to that in just a moment. Understand, you got to embrace grace. If you don't have Christ today, embrace grace. Say, I want Christ. It's important. And see, it's the foundation of Christianity and the essence of salvation. For by grace are you saved. But I, I'm going to start, I told Matt, I'm going to start quoting it this way. For by Jesus Christ are you saved. And he's, per, he's personified in grace. Webster's has eight different definitions for grace, including the four that I'm about to give you that you've probably heard before. Here's grace. I'm going to give you four that you've probably heard. A charming or attractive trait or characteristic. Carry yourself with grace. That's not the grace we're talking about. 
approval fa a favor, remain in his good graces. That's not what we're talking about. A title of address, your grace. I don't know anybody like that, but anyway, it, it, it's one of the definitions. A short prayer at a meal. A lot of you know that one. Amen. Say grace over dinner. Webster's top definition, however, comes closest to the biblical meaning of grace. Unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their salvation or sanctification. Unmerited divine assistance given humans for their salvation or sanctification. That's from Webster's. So, for by Jesus Christ, the divine assistance given to humans for their salvation or sanctification is grace as it's personified. It's incredible. It's incredible. So, we see grace. We understand we can embrace grace, but we can see grace because if you're like me, your eyes are glazed over a bit when you read that. And I need examples, real-life stories that make sense to me. I, you can talk about grace all you want, but I don't think I would get it if I did not know Jesus Christ. And in Luke 15, Jesus says something that's incredible. He gives three stories. He gives three parables in a row that show grace. Let, let's turn to Luke 15. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's right before John, Luke chapter 15. It's the parable of the lost sheep. It's the parable of the lost coin. And it's the parable of the lost son. Now, again... When you're understanding about grace, grace is hard to embrace because we think we're so bad and that God does not love us and sin overwhelms us. Remember, it does not overwhelm God and God does not condemn us and God is loving us. So we have to see grace. And God knew that we would have difficulty understanding about grace. So what did he do? He sent his son. Jesus teaches. Now watch. He teaches three parables. Verse 15. I mean, in chapter 15, verse 1 uh, of Luke 15. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near him to hear him. This is Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes complaining said, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he spoke this parable saying to them, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go out after the one which lost till he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repentance. Again, no judgment, but what does he find? Rejoicing, fellowship, love, eating with sinners, doing business with sinners. Verse 8, he gives another one. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, she loses one coin, does not light a lamp. Sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors uh, together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy. When that thing that was lost is found. And you know what Jesus said? I came to seek and save that which was lost. And then there's the, the parable of the lost son. And you know the story of the prodigal son, right? He wants it all. It's really a story about two sons, and it's not really it's a story about the prodigal son at all. It's not really a story about the other brother who gets mad that the younger brother comes back home. You know what the story is really about? A loving father who loves both sons, the one that is found and the one that was lost, but he's come home. The story is about a loving, a loving father that rejoices even though his son has spent it all, has nothing when he comes back, has vile, been with the pigs, been in the pig pen, and he says, bring the fatted calf, get the ring, put it back on, for my son was lost, but now he is found. Let us rejoice and be merry. For my son has come home. Jesus gives these parables because we need to see grace. These three stories, lost things, three parties. Jesus really wanted the self-righteous people to understand something. God loves bad people and rejoices when they return to him. The Pharisees couldn't believe that God would actually celebrate sinners. They could not hug grace back, the religious. But I guarantee a sinner can hug Jesus. Let me sum this up and close it with this as we talked about grace. You have to see grace. You have to embrace grace. You have to. You have to see it. You have to embrace it. And you have no accusers because grace is a person. Grace is a person. John was one of Jesus' disciples and closest friend. And he wrote this about Jesus in John 1.14. And let me, let me turn there very quickly. John 1.14 and share this with you. Because Jesus... 
It's grace, and he's a person. In John chapter 1, verse number 14, says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Now you say, the Word, yeah. Well, now I've got to go back and give you what chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. God took on the form of flesh because we had to see grace. We could never fathom that the God of the universe would not accuse us and not condemn us. But he took on the form of flesh and he sent his son not to condemn us, but to give us life, to give us hope, to pay our sin debt so that sin is not a burden for us. And it says in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We got to see it. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, This is John the Baptist who comes after me, is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 16, For of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The logos, a Greek term meaning the unique communication or proclamation that God did something so absolutely mind-boggling that it's unique. He took on the form of flesh. The God of glory took on flesh so that we could see grace was a person. And the Word became flesh, full of grace and truth. That means that grace and truth are not enemies. They're on the same side. We don't need to balance grace with truth or truth with grace because both are personified in Jesus. And if we get more of Jesus, we will have more both of grace and truth. He embodied grace. He was grace. He died for us. He loves us. And he's never stopped loving us. And he never will stop loving us. And, and, and for those of us who think we're so bad and that we can't see grace, I'm just saying look at Jesus Christ and you'll see grace. But when you see grace, understand this, he condemned no one. And when you see grace, you need to say, I need to be like him, and I don't need to condemn anyone for anything that they've done. Do you need to pray for them? Yes. Do you need to counsel with them? Yes. But do you need to judge them? Absolutely not. What you need to do is to hope and pray that they would see Jesus Christ. And if Jesus can and does and will forgive them, then so should you. Let me say it this way, so should we. He embodied grace. He was grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For by Jesus Christ you were saved. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Why? Because we'd be boasting. In other words, we need help. So God gives us grace. And his name is Jesus. Bow your heads with me right now. Just bow your heads. When we sing that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. What you see is Jesus Christ taking your place and loving you. And not condemning you. And I am so glad that I had this audience stand in the beginning. Because it reminded us that we all have received and that we all needed grace at one time in our life. Some of you are standing because just recently, just recently, you needed such a toast of grace that you didn't know what to do. I'm going to ask Matt, Dave, Ray, uh, Jim, I want you to come forward, Phyllis. I, I just want you, you folks to come and fill the front here. 
Because there's some people right now that need to experience a hug and embrace grace. They need to know that they're not judged nor condemned, but that God still loves them. Because they are hurting right now. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, young people, Jesus loves you. He told that woman caught in the very act of adultery, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you, but stop doing what you're doing. And we know she did. Because when it comes time at the end, you know who's there anointing his body? That woman caught in the very act of adultery. She was so forgiven, she never forgot it. She experienced grace in such a way, she fell in love with grace. She fell in love with Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you need to slip out of your seat and come pray with one of these folks this morning and say, just pray for me. I need a touch of grace this morning. And I need a hug to know that God still loves me. I just, we are representing the Lord this morning. Just slip out of your seat and come right now. Praise the Lord. Phyllis, there's a young lady coming right, right here down the front. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is there another one? You say, I'm too embarrassed. I'm too ashamed. Jesus is not condemning you. We're not condemning you. We want you to embrace grace here this morning. Embracing grace is embracing Jesus Christ and his love and his forgiveness. Slip out of your seat. God bless you. People are coming this morning. I might, I might need another lady down here. There's some ladies that are coming, and I'm, Phyllis is the only one. If, any, if Jan, why don't you come? If you're available, come right down here. Uh, just you guys come. Someone come. D, come and pray with some of these. I think there's some ladies wanting to come. You don't have to tell these people what you did. Just say, I need a hug from the Lord this morning. I need an embrace from Jesus Christ, and they'll pray with you. They understand what you mean. You don't have to confess anything to them. Just just come and embrace grace don't let it be awkward don't let it hold you back just come this morning and embrace grace praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord anyone else Jim's available to pray with you right here just embracing grace you know life's hard folks life's hard Life's hard. And just come and, 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 and just say, I need a hug from the Lord. I need to embrace this this morning. I'm tired of carrying the weight of this thing. Maybe you've been carrying guilt forever and ever and ever and ever. Today, come and let it go. Maybe you want to come to the altar and say, I'm letting it go. I see grace in Jesus Christ. I'm not condemned in him. I am, I, I am his, and I'm going to shout it from the rooftops, and I'm going to praise him for forgiving me this morning. Praise the Lord. Maybe this morning you're in this audience, you say, I, I, I have never been born again. I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I don't even know how to do it. I don't know how to be saved. I don't know how to come to Christ. I don't know how to come to the Lord. But maybe you want to. Maybe you want to this morning. If you're like that, if you want to be saved and you say, I don't know how to be saved, just stand right where you are. Just stand. I'm going to help you. Don't be embarrassed. You want to be saved? Don't know how to be saved? Is there anybody like that? Just stand right where you are. Nobody's standing. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not going to. Oh, there is someone standing. God bless you. Two young ladies right over here. Praise the Lord. You understand why you're standing? You don't know how to be saved. You want to be saved? You do. You want to have life in Jesus Christ? You want to, you want to go to heaven? You want to understand that God loved you at your very worst and he sent his son to die for you? Why don't, you, why don't you two, if you, if you mean business and you're not just playing a game, if you're for real, just slip, slip out of your seat. Matt, these two young ladies are coming. You coming too, sir? Or they went that way. God bless you. Come on down. Matt, both of them said they're not playing a game. They want to receive Christ as their Savior here this morning. Just weeping, just crying. That's what gra grace will make you cry. <laughs> grace will put tears in your soul. Tears of joy. Tears of release. 
Two have come to be saved. Some have come to lose that burden. Is there someone else this morning? Someone else said, I don't know how to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want my life turned around. Just stand. We've got a man right here that will pray with you right here. Anybody else? I'm going to close. God bless you, young lady. Boy, that took a lot of courage. Look at me. That took a lot of courage. But let me tell you, God loves you. And he sent Jesus to die for you. And you can see grace in Jesus Christ. And he didn't come to condemn you. He came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Would you pray? Come and just pray with this big fellow right over here. Dave, just wrap your arms around this little one like God would wrap his arms around and just, just tell her that's just the same way God's hugging her this morning right here, right now. Amen. God bless her. And there's, there's her friend going with her. Praise the Lord. How sweet. Anyone else? I'm going to close. It's not, about, it's not about me getting a bunch of numbers on my belt. It's not about saying we had this, we had this. It's about you embracing grace. Anyone else? Anyone else? Let's pray for all of those that have come. Let's bow our heads and we'll close. Just remember this. Grace is a person. The greatest person that ever touched this earth was Jesus Christ. And God gave it so that we could see how much God loves us. And if we've seen Jesus, we've seen God. And if Jesus loves us and died for us, understand that the Father and God loves you. And there's nothing, nothing that could ever change it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whoever believes in that will not perish but have everlasting life. But we had to see it, didn't we? We had to see grace personified in the person of Jesus Christ so that we could understand it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you have shown us in Jesus so that we could understand the grace, the unmerited favor that you have given us. And we thank you that Jesus paid our sin debt for our past sins and our present sins and our future sins. And Father, we thank you so much that you are a loving God, a good God, a Father who will never ever ever turn us away who will never forsake us who will never leave us that's always loving us and that has a plan that is a good plan for our future and for our life we thank you for that in your son's most precious name his most precious name in Jesus name I pray amen and Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap offering this morning.